Members, it is time for questions to the Executive Office, and we will start with the list of questions. And I call Mr. Pat Catney to ask the first question. Mr. Catney. Thank you. Uh, question one, First Minister. Thank you very much. Um, we are currently considering the final report of the Commission on Flags, Identity, Culture and Tradition. We will then decide on appropriate next steps, including a decision on the publication of the Commission's report. Call Pat Cadney for uh, Minister, I thank you uh, for your answer. At the start of the summer, I was contacted by a young mother with two young children under seven. Uh, she moved into a lovely new home in my constituency, and some people in the area made assumptions about her background and put a union flag and a UVF flag outside her house. In her own words, she said, I don't want this to happen, but I fear for my children if I complain. I was told if I tried to remove the flags, there would be other consequences. Never come this question. Uh, First Minister, does this sound like the Northern Ireland that both you, I know that you you want, and I want to live in a better Northern Ireland than that. Well, I do thank the member for his question, and I'm very sorry that one of his constituents has had difficulties uh, in this area. Can I say the uh, Commission has had a very extensive stakeholder engagement? Um, they've met with a, a number of people face to face, have received a wide range of written uh, consultation responses as well. Uh, Deputy First Minister and I received uh, the report, I think it was on the 17th of July. Uh, we're currently uh, going through that report with officials and we very much hope that we will be able to come back to uh, the committee and to the Assembly in the near future in relation to our response to the report. Okay, before I call the next uh, question, um, can I remind members who wish to ask a supplementary that would need to uh, remember to raise in their seats? I call Matthew O'Toole. Number two. Thank the member for his question. And, and in response to the Speaker about preparing for Assembly business in the autumn, Deputy First Minister and I provided an early indication of the volume of legislation required for the end of the transition period. The legislative requirements include devolved, reserved, and accepted matters, which means that legislation will be brought forward in both the Assembly and at Westminster. The, identi the identified requirement is focused mainly on secondary legislation and therefore it is anticipated that most of the pressure will in the first instance be on the relevant committees. Departmental officials are briefing their respective committees on the volume of EU exit legislation expected to be brought forward. Call Matthew to supplementary. Mr Speaker, thank you and I thank the um, First Minister for her answer. Um, we are in a very dangerous situation in Northern Ireland. In a few months' time, we will crash out at the end of the transition period. We may or may not have a deal with the EU. Can I ask the First Minister, can I ask both First Ministers, that they urgently step up together and make a joint united plea to the UK Government for serious engagement on delivery of the protocol, protection of all citizens in Northern Ireland, and to stop messing around with our fragile society and protections that exist for everyone here? Member for his uh, supplementary question, uh, and of course, uh, across the executive, we want to see uh, that our businesses are protected at the end of the transition period. That we have unfettered access for our businesses into the GB market, uh, and indeed uh, that the joint committee, which is currently uh, tasked to use their best endeavours uh, to deal with a number of issues identified in the protocol deal with those issues that are in the protocol, particularly around state aid and indeed around goods at risk of entering the single market, which comes through Northern Ireland. I am uh, amazed that that issue has not yet been solved uh, because it's a very straightforward issue. I know a number of our businesses want to see the certainty around that, and I would again call on the Joint Committee to find solutions to these issues that the member has identified. I call Dagnan Magalier, supplementary. Can the Minister indicate what Brexit-related areas will require assembly primary legislation? Sorry, Speaker, I didn't quite catch that because there seemed to be interference uh, there. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry, uh, can the Minister indicate... Oh, sorry. Can the Minister indicate what Brexit-related areas will require assembly primary legislation? Sorry, uh, I didn't hear that initially. Uh, the most recent returns uh, from the 10th of September indicate that consideration has been given to the potential need for three Assembly bills and eight Westminster bills. 
Um, however, the numbers do remain fluid uh, and, and may change. So it is important uh, that we continue to work uh, with uh, UK Government on all of these issues. The three Assembly primary legislation pieces are an education bill, uh, a health and social care cross-border health care bill and an infrastructure omnibus bill. So those are the three that are currently uh, identified and I hope that's helpful for the member. I call Chris Stafford. Uh, Mr Speaker, could my right honourable friend tell me what her opinion is of the um, assessment that was given by Lord Frost recently that Monsieur Barnier and other EU officials deliberately threatened the food supply of the people of Northern Ireland. Does the First Minister agree with me that such antics are despicable and reflective of an EU bureaucracy that's overplayed its hand? Well, as I think I've already indicated uh, to the member for South Belfast, I do think that the Joint Committee uh, could have dealt with these uh, issues uh, in a quicker fashion. Uh, I do also, and I hear the member for South Belfast saying that uh, what Lord Frost had to say yesterday uh, was a lie. Uh, I have to say you need to take that up with Lord Frost, uh, but I have to say I find it wrong, uh, and I did say at the Joint Committee last week when the Deputy First Minister and I joined the Extraordinary Joint Committee that the EU needs to stop using Northern Ireland to get their own way. We are not the plaything of the European Union. It causes great difficulties here in Northern Ireland, Mr Speaker, when people use Northern Ireland in that fashion. I do recall when the then Taoiseach, now the Taunashta, used a photograph of a blown up border post to make his point uh, in the European Union in, in October 2018. That was wrong as well. What we need to do is to focus on getting answers for our consumers, for our businesses and for the citizens of Northern Ireland. And it's quite wrong to use hyperbole uh, to get their own way. What we need to see is the actual protection of peace in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Nicole. Steve Egan. May I thank the First Minister for her answers so far? And I note she used the words very clearly, best endeavours. And when I asked the First Minister uh, to uh, discuss with the Executive, uh, making sure that both the EU and the British Government, through the Joint Committee, make a very clear statement very soon about the implications to our food supply, the implications particularly to do with state aid rules, and above all, what may indeed be the very onerous position that we may be placed in as an assembly under the jurisdiction of the ECJ coming the beginning of next year. Well, I thank the member for his question. And when I refer to best endeavours, of course, I am specifically referencing Article 6 of the protocol, uh, which uh, says very clearly that the European Union and the United Kingdom shall use their best endeavours uh, to facilitate the trade between Northern Ireland and other parts of the United Kingdom. I think what we need to see is more of that best endeavours actually <laughs> being put into action so that we can get a solution to some of the issues that are still outstanding uh, in relation uh, to the protocol. And uh, neither the Deputy First Minister or I, or indeed the entire executive, will be found wanting in our engagement with the UK Government and indeed with the European Union. We have had the extraordinary uh, Joint Committee just last Thursday, at which we both attended. Uh, the junior ministers attend on an ongoing basis uh, meetings with the Paymaster General in relation to the negotiations, and we will continue to engage at the highest level that we can to get across the fact that we need solutions for the people of Northern Ireland. That's what's important. Again, I call Andrew Muir. Uh, Mr Speaker, the House of Commons will consider the Internal Market Bill today. Does the First Minister not agree it is entirely inappropriate for any government to announce its intention to break international law and is precisely not the way to successfully conclude negotiations? Well, I think as I understand uh, the Internal Market Bill, they are notwithstanding clauses uh, and therefore the hope is that there will still be a negotiated settlement through the Joint Committee and in particular around a, a free trade agreement in totality. Uh, that's certainly uh, what we want to see, uh, an agreement which gives us clarity for our businesses, our consumers uh, and indeed our citizens here in Northern Ireland. We want to see that agreement put into place. We recognise that time is very short in relation to all of this and we will not be found wanting in our continued engagement despite all of the other pressures because we recognise how important it is to find solutions in these matters. Okay, thank you. Moving on, I call Linda Dillon. Or am I, Agat, case number three, question number three. 
thank the member for her question. The member will be aware that we have indicated that it is our intention to appoint an Attorney General by means of an open competition based on the principles that apply to public appointments. And while the post of the Attorney General is not regulated by the Office of the Commissioner for Public Appointments for Northern Ireland, it is our intention to adhere to the spirit of the Commissioner's Code of Practice relating to public appointments. We have also decided that it would be timely to review the various aspects of the role of the Attorney General since the post has now been in existence for over 10 years. The outcome of this review will feed into the appointment process and we will be considering proposals on the review process in the near future. Linda Dillon, supplementary. Good. Does the Minister agree that given the very significant challenges that we face at the moment, particularly around COVID and, and Brexit, that it is important that this process is completed? And I accept what you're saying around the process, and I think that that is important, and it's good that you're following the process, but it is important that we have some time frame for this. I thank the member for her, her question, and I am advised by the office that an open competition can take in the region of six months uh, from start to completion. Uh, that's why uh, Deputy First Minister and I have appointed the interim Attorney General for a period of one year, so that we can have continuity of advice and can I just take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to pay tribute to the outgoing Attorney General? It's the first opportunity I have had to do so. Um, Mr. Larkin QC has been in place for over 10 years, uh, over some very turbulent times, and I believe he did uh, discharge his functions in a, in a very good way towards all of the ministers of the executive, because of course he was the executive's principal legal advisor, an onerous task, and I just want to wish him well for the future and in his future career. Thank you. Moving on, I call Mr. Harry Harvey. Thank you very much, Speaker. Um, First Minister, that will be question number four. Thank you. Thank the member for his question. And discussions take place on a regular basis between the four nations of the United Kingdom on a range of matters, including the communication of public health information. Our overall messages are aligned and consistent. These are regular hand washing, social distancing, and the wearing of face coverings. The executive has set out its own roadmap to recovery and renewal. Decisions on the unfolding local context are based on medical and scientific evidence. We have deployed a high-impact public information campaign using television, radio and print and digital platforms to ensure people in Northern Ireland understand how to stay safe and save lives. Sir Harry Harvey, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, First Minister. First Minister, at the multiple Four Nation meetings, has the idea of an agreed joint position on the fight against COVID heading into the winter period been discussed? Thank the member for his questions. And indeed, uh, there is currently a proposal for a UK-wide public information campaign. Uh, this is entitled Hands, Face and Space and is currently being tested here in Northern Ireland, uh, Scotland and in Wales. I think this will be a heavyweight uh, UK-wide campaign. Uh, it is consistent with our messages and will amplify the call to adhere to the public health advice the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, who chairs our quadrilateral meetings, is very keen um, that we have an agreed platform for the UK nations, uh, and he's keen to have that signed off uh, as soon as we can. I'm going to call Jerry Carroll. Ask the First Minister, in regards to the recent uh, changes to restrictions, can the Minister provide us with the evidence that says this virus can spread in homes of over six people, but not in workplaces or schools of more than six people? Yes, uh, absolutely. As you know, the executive acts on the advice given by the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor. And based on our very good track, trace and protect system, uh, we have been able to identify that the source of most of the COVID uh, spreading in the community is caused by household activities, whether that is people going around for coffee or mixing socially in people's homes, uh, or indeed the dreaded house parties, which unfortunately are still taking place. So the reason why we've acted in the way that we have in this graduated way is because the evidence is pointing to the source of uh, the spread of COVID being from our homes. I wish it was otherwise, uh, but that's unfortunately, Mr Speaker, where the evidence is pointing to. I call Jim Allister. Thank you. Uh, whatever 
confusion might arise within the four nations. I suspect the First Minister will agree that the greater challenge lies at home in the undermining of the Executive's message by the episode and the Deputy First Minister's attendance at the story funeral. Can I ask the First Minister, has the Deputy First Minister apologised to her? She hasn't apologised to the public, but she has she apologised to the First Minister for attending the funeral and breaching your own joint regulations? Well, I think the uh, Deputy First Minister has uh, acknowledged that the events at the end of June fundamentally undermined uh, the messaging from the Northern Ireland Executive and that there was a, a, a confused message coming out. Uh, it is right that we have had an acknowledgement uh, of that undermining of uh, public health messaging. Uh, and now investigations will continue, as you know, in relation to police investigations and assembly investigations. But let me say this to the assembly and indeed to anyone else that's listening. We are at a tipping point in relation to COVID-19. And I know, Mr Speaker, that there are those who think um, that we are scaremongering about this issue. And I just want to address that. We are not. We are not. We are in constant contact with our chief medical officer. And again today, I am advised that the postcodes which we have particular concern about, uh, that concern is very much still there. And I do not want to see that spreading across Northern Ireland. We have to act to stop that spreading across Northern Ireland and actually stop people in those postcode areas from uh, spreading COVID-19. Because whilst hospitalisation numbers are, are not yet growing, we all know that there's a lag in terms of hospitalisations and ICU admissions. And I don't want to be standing here in four weeks' time and talking about the huge rise in hospital numbers. I want us to act on it now so that we can get on top of this COVID-19 issue. And when you look at what the BMA is saying today around the fact that over 80% of doctors fear a second wave, Mr Speaker, I think it would be very remiss of us if we did not act and if we did not take action. And I call Martina Anderson. Um, Minister, given, as you know, Ireland is a single epidemiological unit and the virus doesn't recognise in any borders, do you agree, Minister, that there needs to be a consistency in message across this island uh, on public health approach as well as across the islands? I thank the member for her question. As she knows, we have said in our own plan for dealing with COVID-19 that it's important uh, that we continue with our Four Nations approach, particularly in relation to how we fight uh, the virus through the Joint Biosecurity Centre, where the Health Minister receives a lot of his high-level engagement around other jurisdictions across the world. Uh, but of course it's important that we continue to work with our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland as well, so that we can understand what is happening in that jurisdiction, and that if we have to take a, a different route uh, in any one uh, case, that we understand why we're doing that and we can then talk to each other uh, about the messaging. So that continual um, conversation with colleagues in the Republic of Ireland, as well, of course, as with the other four nations, uh, the other three nations, will continue. And indeed, we have another conversation this afternoon uh, with colleagues from Scotland and Wales uh, and the Chancellor for the Duchy of Lancaster in relation to these issues. And I call Robbie Butler. And I, I thank the First Minister for answer to Mr. Wells, uh, Mr. Wells, Mr. Alistair's supplementary question. But on the topic of confused messaging, why would the increasingly erratic MP for East Antrim have formed the opinion that the First Minister was not on the same page as the Health Minister in regards to local restrictions in Ballymena and Belfast? Well, can I say to the member, I think it is important to acknowledge that those of us who have the privilege of sitting on the executive have then the onerous task of taking decisions that impact right across Northern Ireland. That is a big uh, onerous task to have, to have on our shoulders. And I totally understand that other colleagues, and indeed those from other parties, may want to challenge us on the decisions uh, that we take. I stand full square with the decisions that we took in the executive last Thursday. I think they were the right decisions. They were the appropriate, proportionate decisions at that time. I know that there are concerns about those decisions, but I am asking the community in Northern Ireland to work with us to defeat coronavirus and to minimise the number of deaths from this dreadful pandemic, because it is so important that we continue to give leadership in that way. And moving on to question five, Joanne Bunding. Question five, please. 
Thank the member for her questions. Officials have held meetings with representatives of the main institutions found responsible for systematic failings in the Hard Report. These have focused both on providing relevant information to the Redress Board and on the moral obligation to contribute to the redress costs. Now that the redress scheme has launched, we are keen to begin negotiations with a view to ensuring a fair and proportionate outcome. The next steps will include a roundtable meeting with all the institutions to set out the principles for negotiations. Ministers are currently considering how best we can give visible leadership to this very important process. Go on, bonding, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answer. Uh, given the Roman Catholic Church is as wealthy as some countries, have the bishops given any indication of a notional figure uh, that they will contribute and a timescale for payment? And also, are ministers willing to be directly involved in ensuring the church and other smaller orders make appropriate reparations? Well, I think in, in terms of the latter uh, question, very much so. We will be uh, involved in, in that discussion uh, and negotiation. Um, in terms of the cost estimates for financial redress, they range from about $149 million at the lower end up to $402 million uh, as a central estimate, and then up to $668 million at the upper end. And of course, co uh, contributions from institutions could help defray some uh, of those costs. And a meeting with the two uh, archbishops, that's the Roman Catholic Archbishop and the Church of Ireland Archbishop, uh, had been discussed. Uh, and we will shortly be writing uh, to both archbishops and indeed the institutions, because I think what we need to try and understand is the fact that the institutions are separate uh, institutions, and that sometimes makes it complicated in terms of uh, gaining contributions and having those conversations. So, absolutely, we're going to continue with the negotiations. We're going to have those conversations because we think there is a moral imperative in relation to this issue so that we can put an end to this very dark stain in our history. Thank you, Nicole. Fran McCann. Well, I'm going to call you. Uh, can the Minister advise if any progress has been made on the apology as recommended by Judge Hart? I thank the member for his question. Uh, as the member knows, there, was, uh, there has been an interim uh, advocate uh, in place, and he was working uh, with the groups in relation uh, to the apology. There has been, uh, I think it's fair to say, a bit of a breakdown between some survivors and the interim advocate. And so the executive office was separately engaging with one of those groups in a, in a parallel process, if you like. So uh, we're waiting to hear uh, from the interim advocate. We're also very close to the end of a process in connection with the appointment of a full-time commissioner. And we very much look forward to making an announcement in relation to that issue. Uh, Mr Speaker, I know it's something that this House has taken a keen interest in, uh, and it's also something that we want to pursue as well. So that Commissioner, when he or she is appointed, will certainly be taking up the issue of an apology, an issue of the memorial, as well as, of course, of dealing with victims' needs uh, and, indeed, the redress scheme as well. I call Cara Hunter. Mr Speaker, uh, and I thank the First Minister for her answers uh, so far. We welcome all and any progress uh, in victims receiving payments. Um, can I ask the First Minister, uh, you had alluded to previously that you're in conversations with um, other uh, aspects of the Christian belief, but is there any money secured in addition to the Catholic Church, or are you still having a conversational, is that still in a conversational stage? Thank you. Well, uh, of course, the um, government, when we set up uh, this process said that we felt very strongly that we had a responsibility to uh, give redress to the people who had been through such a horrific time uh, as a result of being in an institution. But we do fundamentally believe that there is a moral imperative upon some of those institutions to come forward uh, and to talk to us about reparation uh, for what happened in those institutions. So we will be pursuing those conversations, Mr Speaker, because we believe it's something that this House wants us to pursue, and indeed the public in general. Okay, I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. Question eight. Sorry, sorry First Minister. I thought you were asking a supplementary. You you're ahead of yourself. So. Okay. I'm moving on then to... Uh, I'll move on to uh, Michelle Magalveen. Question six. 
Thanks to the member for her question. And the Executive Office has designated the Department of Justice to exercise the administrative functions of the Victims Payment Board and has agreed to provide grants to the Department to establish the scheme's administrative arrangements. This will allow the recruitment of board members, IT developments and other steps needed to establish the board to proceed. A substantial programme of work is underway with the Department. However, more work remains to be implemented before a scheme of this complexity and magnitude can become operational. Deputy First Minister and I will be meeting the Justice Minister shortly to discuss next steps. Michelle Magelveen, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the First Minister for her response. Further to that, could I ask the First Minister if all ministers in the executive are now committed to ensuring victims who have already been waiting far too long receive their payments at the earliest possible point, regardless of any dissatisfaction that they might have around issues such as eligibility or indeed any other matters? I thank the member for her supplementary question. I very much hope that it is the case that all ministers are on board for this now. We've had a, a court case which has been quite divisive, Mr Speaker. I think it's important that we now move on and get the scheme uh, implemented as quickly as possible. As I've indicated, there is a substantial programme of work that has to be uh, carried out by the Department of Justice. We will support the Department of Justice where we can uh, in relation to that. So, for example, to give an indication of what needs to be uh, achieved, we need uh, an appointment for the President of the Victims Board by the Lord Chief Justice, um, and then the appointment and induction of board members by the Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Committee. Uh, we need to secure additional funding uh, from Westminster in recognition that this just isn't a scheme that operates here in Northern Ireland, but across the United Kingdom. Uh, we need the finalisation of an IT system, an appointment of an assessment services provider, development of an assessment process, and then agreement by the Victims Payment Boards of its government and decision-making policy. So there's a big job of work to be done. We're up for that job of work, uh, but we need to do it in quick time so that we can get funding out to many victims who need to have their victims' needs acknowledged, first of all, by the payment, and then hopefully the payment will ease some of the suffering that they're currently enduring. Thank you, Nicole. Colin McGrath. Mr Speaker, would the First Minister agree with me that it's important that the First and Deputy First Minister offer an apology to those victims that they forced to go to court to secure their right to that pension? Well, I have to say to the member it is a matter of deep regret uh, that, uh, that members, not just one member, but indeed uh, many members of the victims community and survivors community felt that they had to go to court to have this matter dealt with. Uh, I hope now that we can move on in a fast time, that we can support the Department of Justice to have this issue dealt with as quickly as possible. We do, of course, need to deal with the funding issue, and we will deal with that. Uh, but it's important that we have all the processes in place uh, as well. And as I've indicated, there are quite a number of processes that need to be dealt with. So very much want to see this dealt with as quickly as possible. It would, of course, have been my wish that it was dealt with in the appropriate manner. Olivia Flynn. Uh, yes, Gormi Agha um, Does the Minister agree that there would be a compelling responsibility on the Westminster Government to help fund this scheme? Well, I think that that is right, because uh, if you look at the uh, Treasury's own guidance in relation to uh, funding, it clearly says that the funding follows the person who has made the policy decision, and the policy decision uh, was made at Westminster by the, Secretary, by the then Secretary of State. So it's important that we continue to work with the Minister of Justice, the Minister of Finance, the Deputy First Minister and myself so that we can get the appropriate funding in place. We have to do that. Uh, it's not a we would like to do that. We have to do that to make sure that the funding is in place. And that ends the period for a list of questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And uh, I call on Ms. Uh, Martina Anderson. Before doing so, I just to notify members that questions two and four have been withdrawn. So, call Martina Anderson. Topical. Um, Minister, do you agree with the assessment from Nicholas Sturgeon that the Internal Market Bill is a full frontal attack? on this assembly? Um, well, as the member knows, um, there are differing views on Brexit in the uh, executive. Uh, each of us uh, took different views at the time of the referendum. Um, in terms of the internal market bill, uh, it is to try and deal 
uh, with non-discrimination and mutual recognition for goods going from the Northern Ireland market into the GB market. As the member will know, uh, the GB market is our largest market, so it is important that we have unfettered access into that market, and that is what I hope this bill will achieve. Supplementary. Minister, part six of the bill, as you know, it gives uh, it empowers British ministers to override the budgetary role of this assembly and to make spending decisions without consulting with you, without consulting with the ministers, and without consulting with the finance minister. So, minister, are you saying that this unacceptable level of interference and the undermining of the Good Friday Agreement is justified? I think what I'm saying to the member is that it's important that the UK market succeeds into the future, uh, because as I've just indicated, the UK market uh, is the most important. When you add all of the other markets together, it's not as big as the GB market. Therefore, it's important that we have uh, a free flow, and that internal market bill uh, goes some way to dealing with that. Not dealing with all of the issues, deals with some issues, deals with uh, issues around uh, unfettered access, the export declarations. And I am sure that no one in this House would want to see a fettering of access to the GB market uh, for all of our businesses and consumers. One of the things that concerns me is that the Joint Committee still has not come to a determination on goods at risk. And therefore, that still remains a huge issue for us. And as I've already indicated, that should not be used as a bargaining chip, but instead it should be dealt with as quickly as possible. I call Stuart Dixon. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, would you agree with uh, the Lord Chief Justice, Sir Declan Morgan's comments that breaking of international law could undermine trust in the government and the administration of justice? I think it is important that all of us uh, look to the law on these issues and that we look back again at the protocol, which of course my party uh, argued against, voted against. We didn't believe it was good for Northern Ireland, still don't believe it is good for Northern Ireland. Uh, this internal market bill uh, is dealing with some of the issues in that protocol. But it's important to look back at, at that protocol, and that protocol says in its preamble that the application of this protocol should impact as little as possible on the everyday life of communities in both Ireland and Northern Ireland, having regard to the importance of maintaining the integral part of Northern Ireland in the United Kingdom's internal market. That's what I want to see happening. I don't like all of the protocol. In fact, I vehemently don't like it. But what we have to do now is to clarify those issues, which should be dealt with in the Joint Committee but they haven't thus far. So again, I make the plea that they're dealt with so that we can move on. Stuart Dixon, supplementary. Thank you, and thank you for your answer so far. Uh, Minister, Minister, would you not agree with me that um, any change to an international agreement undermines uh, trust and confidence of the nation that entered into that agreement, uh, and that it has the potential uh, to make the United Kingdom look like a rogue state in the international community? Well, I'm sure that the United Kingdom government will take all of the legal advice that is available to them on all of these issues. But I, I do say again to the member that the EU and the UK have a job of work to do. Uh, Article 1 of the protocol states very clearly that the protocol respects the territorial integrity of the United Kingdom. I have yet to see much evidence for that, Mr Speaker, uh, and we need to see evidence of that. Yes, for me as a constitutional unionist, of course, but also for our businesses and our consumers and our citizens. They all need clarity. We should have had that clarity by now, and unfortunately, we're still in a position where there's negotiations ongoing. I call Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the First Minister what the key objectives that she wants to see as outcomes or the outcomes of the ongoing Brexit negotiations? Well, I do want to see uh, a top line. I would like to see uh, uh, an EU-UK free trade agreement, tariff-free agreement, so that we can continue with that. And as I understand it, uh, what has been put forward by Lord Frost as the UK negotiator uh, is in line with other uh, trade agreements made by the European Union with other nations. So there is a, a 
he, he can't really understand why uh, the EU is putting up such a defence to some of the issues that has been raised. Uh, and then, of course, the key issues, as I understand it, from the chief negotiator that are, is outstanding at the moment is around state aid, uh, fisheries, uh, and then, of course, the protocol operation, which is dealt with in, in the Joint Committee. So there's much to do, and I hope we can achieve that so that we can have free trade uh, between ourselves and the European Union, but importantly for our main market, that we continue to have that unfettered access. Trevor Clark, Supplementary. And can I thank uh, the First Minister for answering? I suppose, following the previous questioners, do you actually believe that the parties, all the parties, recognise the potential impact to Northern Ireland economy if there is an unsatisfactory conclusion to the talks? Sometimes when I, I listen to EU negotiators and they talk about peace in Northern Ireland, it, it is apparently only if we have free access north-south. There are very little uh, conversations about access east-west. and Of course, we do need that in a more fundamental way. I can understand why the north-south issue uh, was such a big issue, uh, and I recognise that. But there were other ways to deal with that, Mr Speaker. Those other ways were poo-pooed and not listened to. And unfortunately, we now find ourselves in this situation. So there needs to be an acknowledgement that east-west, the integrity of the United Kingdom, needs to be protected uh, as much as having to deal with the north-south uh, trade. Thank you. And I call Emma Rogan. Um, can I ask the Minister for an update on the Executive Working Group on, on Mental Health and Wellbeing, Resilience and Suicide Prevention? I thank the Member for her question. This is indeed uh, a very important issue that we resolve to, to deal with at one of our very first uh, executive meetings. Um, I think the Minister of Health, if I'm correct in quoting him, said it was one of the most apolitical meetings that he had ever seen because everybody just wanted to try and find solutions, which at that time was pre-COVID. Uh, so now we're having to deal with COVID as well as all of the other pressures uh, facing people right across Northern Ireland. So we've had, our, we've had a number of meetings of the working group. It's something that we're very much all committed to working through. Uh, and of course, after that, we have to find the funding uh, to deal with many of the issues that will be identified. Emma Rogan, supplementary. Will the Minister reaffirm her commitment to tackle the issue of poor mental health and suicide in the areas of greatest social need? Member, and one of the things we're doing is having uh, some scoping work carried out for us so that we can try and identify where the need is uh, and also whether different aspects of interventions are needed in different areas. So I think that, that is important to acknowledge. Uh, I should have also said, of course, that one of our NDNA commitments was to appoint a mental health champion. Very pleased that Professor Siobhan O'Neill has been put into that role, uh, and she is already providing leadership in this area, and we're very pleased to see that she's doing that. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, returning to the issue of, of the coronavirus, uh, First Minister, can you confirm if a date has been set for a meeting of, of the British Irish Council? Uh, to discuss the issue of common messaging and common themes and indeed a common policy in relation to travel in the common travel area? Well, as you know, uh, the Deputy First Minister and I had requested uh, this British Irish Council meeting. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, a date as yet, and as I understand it, uh, the standing date for a British Irish Council meeting is coming up very soon. Uh, if the, uh, we don't get the freestanding meeting before that meeting, you can bet your bottom dollar that we will definitely be bringing this issue up at the BIC. In that regard, it is important that the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement are used in their totality, and they, have, they can come into their own here in terms of north-south and east-west relationships. So, uh, I, I welcome the fact that the minister is going to push for that date. And would she agree that it is vitally important that we have a common messaging and common uh, understanding of the issues facing us as a result of COVID-19 COVID across these islands? Well, absolutely. It's important that we understand where every jurisdiction is in relation to the battle uh, against COVID. Uh, we did raise this issue uh, with the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster just, I think it was last week, the Deputy First Minister raised this issue again. Uh, and he said he was in favour uh, of holding a British Irish Council meeting to discuss these matters. So we hope that that will happen in the near future, Mr Speaker, so that we can discuss the totality of issues that we want to discuss. Thank you. And I call Robbie Butler.
Mr. Speaker, uh, could I ask the Minister if she has a time frame for the setting up of the Office for Identity and Culture and the appointments of an Irish Language and Ulster Scots Commissioner? Well, as the Member uh, knows, uh, we entered government again uh, back on the 11th of January with a whole raft of issues under the New Decade, New Approach. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, with the interruption which has been caused by COVID, we haven't been able to proceed in as fast a manner as uh, we would have liked. However, having said that, there have been a number of NDNA commitments that we have been able to proceed with, and those that we still haven't been able to proceed with, uh, we will certainly look to proceed with them in the 2020-2021 uh, period. Uh, so, for example, in terms of what we have achieved, we have appointed, or rather the Northern Ireland Office has appointed a Veterans Commissioner. We have an expert panel on tackling educational underachievement established, and the work is underway there. Uh, just today, we have had the flag regulations laid in the Assembly. We have had the interim mental health champion I have just referred to appointed and in place. And we have also had confirmation that contaminated blood victims in Northern Ireland will have increased payments in line with Great Britain. Those are just an example of some of the things we have been able to proceed with uh, in NDNA. But, of course, there is much more that we need to do as well. Uh, Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for answering. Uh, indeed, some, work ha some good work has already uh, happened out of NDNA. Would the uh, First Minister be confident that nothing has happened within this COVID pandemic to shake the, uh, the relationship within the executive to deliver on all the promises under NDNA? I think we have a very clear understanding right across the executive, right across the five parties, that the reason we came back into this place was on the basis of the NDNA agreement and therefore all of the things that we have committed to in that. And don't forget there are some of the things uh, in that NDNA that we need to discuss around prioritisation and funding and what have you, not the matters that he has discussed, but there are other issues that uh, are just mentioned in the possible or could. Uh, but there are things that we have all committed to and therefore we need to proceed. I get a call. Steve Egan. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister if the remarks today by the MP for East Antrim have undermined the Northern Ireland Executive's common message on COVID? Well, I think he meant the First Minister, not the Deputy First Minister. <laughs> Oh, Steve, Steve. It's good to have a bit of fun uh, in the Assembly. Um, I think what is important is that the Executive continues to give a very clear message in relation to COVID and the fact that we are in a dangerous position. Now, I think I have underlined that through what I have said today. Others will uh, challenge and uh, maybe even criticise at times, but when we are in the Executive Office, uh, we have to show leadership in terms of the functions that are given to us and the advice that is given to us, and that is what I I will continue to do. Before I call Mr Reagan for a supplementary, I would like to thank the, and commend the First Minister for her handling of that intervention. First Minister as well for handling that intervention as well. But my supplementary is, bearing in mind the remarks from the East Antrim MP, would she care to comment on the remarks from her, further de from her Deputy First Minister? I'm not giving an apology to the people of Northern Ireland for the events of the 30th of June, which has considerably undermined the message for health for everybody who's trying to deal with COVID. Well, I seem to be answering questions for a whole range uh, of people today, Mr Speaker, and I'm sure the Deputy First Minister will want to address the issues that the member has raised himself. I've already answered Mr Alistair in relation to that question. I think it was important to uh, reflect uh, on what had been said and done back at the end of June. We now are very much focused on delivering very strong messaging in relation to COVID-19, and I think it's important that we continue to do that. They call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the First Minister for an update on implementing the Ulster Scots element of the new decade, new approach? Uh, as I've indicated, uh, all of those elements in the new decade, new approach that we haven't yet been able to implement, that doesn't mean work hasn't been ongoing from an uh, official's point of view. There have been a uh, number of meetings in relation to the Office uh, for Identity, uh, the Irish Language Commissioner, the Ulster British Commissioner. Uh, so it's important that we continue along the road and get uh, moving in relation to all of our NDNA commitments. It's important that we deliver on the reason why we came back uh, into this Assembly. Brief question, Mr. Uh, Eason. Um, can I ask the, the Minister and thank her for her answer? What are your hopes for the new Veterans Commissioner? 
Well, I very much welcome the appointment of the Veterans Commissioner by the Northern Ireland Office. I think all of us in this House will know Danny very well. We will know that he will be very committed to working on behalf of veterans right across Northern Ireland. He has a big job of work. I think we all acknowledge that because there are some, some difficulties for veterans uh, in accessing what they need. And I very much look forward to meeting with him in the near future so that we can have a discussion on what he has already identified as the needs of that community. Members, the time is up, and I would ask members just to take a raise for a moment to switch the seats.